Hello students, welcome back. Today we will discuss uh, about the environment and the development. Okay, uh, as usual, you can check this uh, on your textbook uh, at chapter 10. Okay, so let's begin. We will talk about uh, some basic issues regarding the environment and development. So the environmental issue affect and are affected by economic development. So that is very true that uh, the economic development affects the environment, but uh, the economic development is also affected by the environment. So they have uh, some kind of uh, two-way causation, right? And then the classic market failures lead to too much environmental degradation. That is also very true. The market failures will lead to environmental degradation. Uh, you see, like for example, if you do not have any regulation or rules regarding industry or regarding the uh, the regarding the protection of the environment, for example, so people are free to build uh, whatever they want. They are free to build sky skyscrapers wherever they want. Then what's going to happen is it's going to have a negative effect. Uh, to the environment because then people will use uh, the land as they please they wouldn't care about the forest uh, and also uh, mining also if you don't have regulation regarding mining then all of the natural resource uh, will be extracted and then what's going to happen is environmental degradation okay and then poverty and lack of education may also lead to non-sustainable use of environmental resource this is also true. Uh, we will talk uh, later uh, regarding the poverty and the environmental issue. And then the global warming and attendant climate change is growing concern in developing countries. Actually, the global warming and the climate change is a uh, growing concern not only in developing country, not only in developing countries, but also in developed countries as well, right? And then. Uh, sustainable development and environmental accounting so this is uh, some of the issue that are very important uh, in the environmental uh, economics uh, we will uh, talk later about the su sustainable sustainable development and environmental accounting but uh, what I mean by sustainable development is uh, when the economic development is not a threat for the environment okay so if some people may believe that the thrive of the environment and the economic development is some kind of trade-off well with the sustainable development it should not be a trade-off okay and then let's see uh, what is it about so sustainable development has been defined as meeting the new needs of present generation without compromising the well-being of future generation okay so this is very true because when we talk about the environment condition uh, what we are concerned is actually the well-being of the next generation not the current generation because we would have a uh, long diet you know uh, years from now but the next generation our children our grandchildren they will inherit uh, the environment right so that's why it is important uh, to take care of the environment for the future generation and that's kind of the focus of the sustainable development okay so running down the capital stock is not consistent with the idea of sustainability um, yep that's true uh, if we just uh, mindlessly use or mindlessly take advantage of our capital stock without thinking of uh, what's going to happen in the future then it will definitely will not be consistent with the idea of sustainability and then the environmental and the other forms of capital are substitutes only to a degree that is very important to underline here so like i said before if someone said that the economic development and the environment uh, are trade-offs well, the truth is they are not a uh, substitute forever. Maybe it's true when we want to build a new industry, maybe there are uh, some of the environment that needs to be sacrificed, maybe the land or maybe 
I don't know, we will have pollution, uh, things like that. Well, that is true that in the beginning they can be kind of substitute or trade-off, but the truth is they cannot be substitute forever. So that's why uh, it is said here that environmental and other forms of capital like building or natural resource uh, when you uh, are in the mining are substitute only to a degree, right? Uh, eventually, they likely act as complements. That is true. If we only care about the industry or the economy without caring about the environment, how are we going to continue living? How about the next generation? Because we basically live in the environment, so we have to take care of it, right? So that's why they are complements instead of substitute. In developing countries, environmental capital is generally a larger fraction of the total capital. Okay. And uh, to know whether environmental capital is increasing or decreasing, we need the environmental accounting. So, like, uh, you know what they say about Indonesia, for example, we have very abundant natural resources, we have a very fertilized uh, soil, you know, and our environmental capital is uh, is in yeah sorry we have large portion of environmental capital and it is important for us to take care of it and we we have to be able to identify whether as time goes by it's increasing or decreasing so that's why uh, we need the environmental accounting okay um if you ever heard something that is called carbon accounting uh, that's when we uh we kind of want to calculate uh, the loss uh, in terms of environment, in terms of pollution, in terms of carbon um, that can be monetized financially. So like we, we, we can identify uh, how much uh, do we lose uh, in the environment because of the economic development. Okay. And then here uh, we go deeper in the environmental accounting so you have here a formula for the sustainable net national product where we have oops sorry where we have a um, form, formula for sustainable net national product we have nni here where nni is the sustainable national income uh, we have nni equals to gni uh, subtract by dm subtract by dn and gni here is the gross national income and the dm here is the depreciation of manufactured capital asset and the dn here is the depreciation of environmental uh, capital okay let me underline this for you so gni is the gross national income dm is the depreciation of manufactured capital assets and the dn is the depreciation of environmental capital okay so uh, typically we only focus in here right we either use gni or we use uh, gdp but now because we are aiming for the sustainable national product so we have to account for the depreciation of the environmental capital and also the depreciation of the manufactured capital okay then here is the more expansively sustainable net national product uh, you have nni equals to gni subtract by dm subtract by dn subtract by r and subtract by a subtract by a and then like uh, the previous one you have uh, so nni is the net eh, sorry let me go back uh, sustainable national income and the gni is gross national income and the dm is depreciation of the manufactured asset uh, manufactured capital asset and the dn is the depreciation of the environmental uh, capital and then we have a new variable here r is the expenditure needed to restore the environmental capital and then A is expenditure required to avert the destruction of environmental capital, right? So R and A here is very, very important. 
So, in order to have a sustainable national income, we have to consider R and A. So, R is uh, how much we need to restore the environmental capital. And then A is how much we need to uh, make sure uh, that the destruction of environmental capital doesn't happen. Okay, so A here is the prevention and then R here uh, to restore the environmental capital. Okay, not that here R and N A are components of GNI but not uh, NNI. Okay, uh, the next one is we're going to talk about so uh, the poor, uh, the poor population. Like uh, previously, uh, we have mentioned that poverty and lack of education may also lead to non sustainable use of environmental resource. So, we are going to discuss about it right now. So, here uh, we have the poor as both agents and victims of environmental degradation. So what's interesting is uh, the poor, they can be agents and also the victims of the environmental degradation. The poor as victims, uh, that's because the poor live in environmentally degraded lands which are less expensive because the rich avoid them. So they already live uh, in a environmentally degraded lands. So it's already... Uh, they are already become the victim of the degradation of the environment and then people living in poverty have less political clout to reduce pollution that is true they don't really have power uh, to you know uh, give contribution to reduce the pollution uh, where they live and then living in less productive polluted lands give the poor less opportunity to work their way out of poverty Yep, because they live in a polluted lands, in a environmentally degraded land, so their opportunity to work their way out of the poverty is uh, not very good. And then the next one is the poor as the agents of the environmental degradation. So we know that the high fertility rate of the of people living in poverty. So well, uh, this is this is true. Although this is kind of unique. You know, when you live uh, in the already, uh, in the already uh, environmentally degraded lands and then you have even more people in there, so like they have a lot of children and because they have a high fertility rate, uh, what's going to happen is it's going to get worse for the environment, right? The land that's already uh, been bad, it's going to be worse, okay? and then the short time horizon uh, of the poor so um, I will I will uh, explain this like the short horizon is like because the poor people they don't really have uh, any not not much they, they, they don't have much choice so they will go to something that is practical and uh, the one that is more visible to them right and sometimes the decision that are possible, sorry, that are feasible to them might not always be suitable for the environment. So like for example, uh, I know that uh, in some remote area in Indonesia, uh, when um, someone has uh, finished, for example, harvesting uh, their, uh, their land, their farm, and then uh, it's going to be costly uh, to you know rehabilitated the land or take care of the land after they harvest so what they do is they're going to burn them down so the the farm is going to be burned with fire and it's going to be bad for the environment but you know the poor has no choice because it's the least costly way so this is uh, what uh, i mean by the short time horizon of the poor well can we blame them I don't think it's right to just hundred percent blame them because uh, their constraint is their cost. Uh, sorry, the constraint is the cost, right? So if you want to, you know, pointing out that it's wrong to do that, then you you have to give give a way out. How do you deal with the cost? You know, because they don't have uh, enough resource to deal with the cost to take care of the land. Okay.
and then the next one is uh, the issue of land tenure in security and then the last one is incentive for rainforest resettlement so it's not only rainforest it could be anything uh, maybe you have seen that in Yogyakarta for example you don't see uh, as much as um, you don't see uh, as many as a uh, rice field as it used to be do you know why because uh, there is a resettlement uh, for the uh, rice field you know a lot of the property uh, agency they buy those rice fields and then convert it uh, for the new apartments new buildings and things like that and actually it's it's good money you know to just sell your rice fields uh, in this area so it, it, it's not very surprising that the incentive for resettlement uh, is quite high and can you really blame them <laughs> well uh, it's such a, a complex things uh, to ask okay <coughs> and then the next one uh, this is uh, we, we still talk about the environment and development issue and there is issue of sustainable development and environmental accounting we have talked about this and then there is also issue about population resource and the environment you know uh, maybe you have heard uh, Malthus theory right where uh, the uh, the food or the resource is going to be limited uh, meanwhile the growth of the population is going to be uh, well kind of infinite so it's going to be scarcity well uh, the similar thing happens uh, with the environment the population keeps growing but the land where we stand the supply uh, is not going to multiply so that's why uh, there will be scarcity and then uh, the issue of the poverty and environment we have talked about this as well and then there is also an issue growth versus environment uh, this is what i said uh, previously some people think that the economic development or economic growth uh, is trade-off with the environment i think temporary temporary it might be true but in the long term it should not be like that and then there is also an issue about the rural development and the environment okay uh, i think the this one and this one is not uh, very different okay and then the next issue so if we have rural development in here we also have the urban development and the environment uh, the issue is still similar right are they trade-off or uh, they should not be trade-off if they should not be trade-off then the rural development and the urban development must be a sustainable development okay and then the next one is the global environment and the economy uh, this is also similar should there be a trade-off or should we change the development uh, sorry the economy to be sustainable and then there is also issue about the nature and pace of greenhouse uh, and gas induced climate change well climate change is a big issue there are a lot of uh, research that um, talk about it if you are interested then i suggest uh, you take a look at those papers and then the next one is the natural resource based livelihood as a pathway out of poverty promise and limitation uh, we will discuss about this a little bit more uh, in the next slide okay so let's take a look at this natural resource based livelihood pathways out out of poverty so because we previously said that uh, the poor people they are both the agent and the victims of the environment uh, environment degradation sorry so now uh, there is an alternative which is called the natural resource based livelihoods uh, what is it oh it's uh, so it's basically like uh, if you try to uh, build a living environment that is in tune with the nature so that's basically the the idea of the natural resource based livelihood okay so this is an alternative that is said to be one of the uh, alternative to uh, as pathway to out of uh, poverty but is it true so there is some uh, there is some limitation and there is some um, advantage of it so we will discuss about it okay 
So let's see, uh, in low-income countries, high dependence on natural resource. Uh, so typically in low-income countries, we have high dependence on natural resource. Like for example, because we have uh, agriculture, we have animal husbandry, we have fishing, forestry, hunting, and then foraging. Okay, so we have high dependence on natural resource. Nevertheless, uh, access to the benefit of the resource often very inequitable. So even though we have high dependence to the natural res on the natural resource, it's not always easy to access the benefit of the resource. You know because because a lot of things we might not have the skill. Sorry, I mean the poor population might not have the sufficient skill to do that, or maybe they don't have the sufficient technology to do that. Uh, or maybe because um, they don't have the required required tools to do that. Uh, that can also be one of the reasons. And then because of that, the poor losing control of the natural resource common areas. So the poor, they don't have control anymore for the natural resource. Well, maybe not like 100% don't have access anymore, but they can only access a little of the whole natural resource because like i said lack of technology lack of skill lack of tools things like that and then many poor lack farmland ah, this is what i just said before many poor they are lack of farmland forests cattle boats and equipment uh, and then this is a sad uh, phenomena and then uh, because the the rest of the environment is not yet uh, exposed or sorry is not yet explored by the poor so what's going to happen is some of those area some of those common village lands may be spontaneously privatized you know like uh, for example let's say there is a village uh, near the the beach for example uh, people of that village they are poor and they are fishing right but because they are poor, they can only afford low quality of boat and low quality of equipment. So what happened is they, they, they are going to uh, take a little, only a little advantage of the environment. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, the rest of the beach, the rest of the environment uh, are still there uh, without being uh, touched at all. And then what's going to happen is... Uh, people who have the required uh, resource they can come to the beach and then they can spontaneously privatize the beach like for example they can build new hotel they can build a resort and things like that so those people uh, they are going to be the one who benefit the most of the environment instead of the poor people okay you might uh, argue that but the poor people, they can work at the hotel, yes, but it's still going to be less benefit uh, than those people who actually built the hotel, right? So uh, that's what happened. And then the other problem that can happen is the governments may overlook uh, companies logging, fishing, and mining without regard to local people or traditional right. This is also very common. So what's going to happen is like... Uh, for example, if you want to open new mining area uh, for coal, for example, in, in Kalimantan or Sumatra, and then uh, if you uh, already sign an agreement with the government, what's going to happen is the government will make sure that your mining is going well uh, and there is a potential that they might overlook the well-being of the local people uh, in the area or the native people in the area, okay? And then the government, this, uh, the government uh, designate the lands protected and then banning livelihood while corruption remains, no incentive to take part uh, in the protection. So uh, the other things that potentially happen with the government is they may uh, designate the lands as protected and then they will ban livelihoods uh, in that area like uh, for example if um, 
you live uh, in a village and then uh, in around the village there are some uh, like animals that must be protected or something then the government might uh, ban people to live there because it's going to be the protected area uh, and then you will be asked to live but what's going to happen is if uh, there is corruption uh, in the in the country then there will be no incentive uh, for other people or for people in general to take part uh, in the protection so then even though the area is going to be designated as protected uh, there is uh, there are not many party that are going to take part in the protection okay so what's the solution for all of that uh, problem so one of the ideal solution well, supposedly ideal solution is for the proper governance uh, where all of the policy uh, is going to empower the poor what does that mean it means that when the government is going to uh, create the policy they will first need to really assess what the poor needs okay so not just uh, go on with what they think is right but they need to really assess what the poor people need okay uh, is natural resource based livelihood one of the pathway it depends because it's case by case okay and then the next one uh, we have uh, the scope of domestic origin environmental degradation so basically environmental problems have consequences both for health and productivity uh, we have a loss of agriculture productivity and then we have prevalence of unsanitary condition and then loss of productivity and sanitary condition created by lack of clean water and sanitation and then dependence of biomass fuel and pollution and then there is also airborne pollutants so those are some problem that can be caused uh, from the environmental degradation and then there is also uh, this uh, tale of two villages so basically this is where we are going to wait a minute so uh, to clarify how rural poverty and environmental degradation interact let us take a brief look at two hypothetical developing world village one in africa and the other are in south uh, american so basically uh, this is like a study case that will show us uh, how rural poverty and environmental degradation uh, interact interact okay let's take a look at the example of african village so they have uh, a phenomena called uh, desertification what is desertification it's the transformation of a region into dry barren land with little or no capacity to sustain life without the artificial uh, source of water so uh, here because um, there is no no merit uh, in the uh, in terms of the environment uh, in where they live and there is also no alternative uh, for a better uh, environment sorry for a better uh, source other than the current bad environment where they live so there is a low opportunity cost uh, of woman's time uh, so uh, it will encourage way so let me explain uh, this part so uh, it is generally the job of women to collect enough firewood for the day's cooking and it may take hours to walk to and from an area where it is available adding considerably the day's work but there is no alternative forms of fuel available uh, in the local market and even if they were household funds would be insufficient to purchase them in fact many women spend additional time collecting precious firewood to make charcoal which can then be sold in the cities for the equivalent of few pennies uh, which helps by household necessities so there is low opportunity cost of women's time perpetuates the wasteful use of forests and worsens the local environment condition okay 
so because of the there is no alternative then taking what's on the forest so uh, the the people or the women especially they will go and take uh, what they can take for, from the forest and it's going to be worsen the condition of the environment okay and then the next one is the representation uh, of south american village so let's uh, take a look at this here so we have soil erosion and then deforestation uh, what are those uh, let's see so uh, here uh, in the hypothetical south american village uh, the study case is because the people uh, who are farmers uh, mostly farmers here in the south american village they do the their agriculture business without uh, without considering uh, the the negative effect for the environment what's going to happen is they will experience soil erosion and deforestation so soil erosion is the uh, loss of valuable topsoils resulting from overuse of farmland and the deforestation and consequent flooding of farmland meanwhile deforestation is the clearing of forested land either for agricultural purpose or for uh, logging for use as the firewood so you can imagine what happened here is the farmers they do their farming in the forest and because of that uh, the forest uh, is going to is going to be is going to be broken right because now the forest is converted uh, into uh, farmland okay and then the next one there is a global warming and climate change scope migration and adaptation so the benchmark is 2007 ipcc report paints a dire picture for developing economies so recent report amplify um, that the impact of global warming likely hardest on the poorest and the agriculture harm in tropical and subtropical areas and the resultant conflicts over natural resource may grow and then the range of adverse health uh, impacts okay this is some of the impacts of the climate change in developing countries according to uh, ipcc the first one is prolonged droughts uh, and then expanded the de de desertification and then increase severity of storms uh, we have seen this uh, lately right with heavy flooding and erosion and then longer and more severe heat waves uh, we also already experienced this and then reduce summer river flow and then water shortage and then decrease grain yields i think we have seen this as well and the climate induced spreading range of pests and disease like what we experience right now it's part of uh, because of the environment degradation and then loss and contaminated groundwater and then deteriorated freshwater lakes coastal fisheries mangroves and coral reefs and then also coastal flooding and then loss of essential species such as pollinators and soil organisms and then the last one is forests and crop fires I think it's scary because we have experienced all of this right uh, in our lifetime so we really really need to take care of the environment and then the next one is uh, global warming and climate change scoop mitigation and adaptation problem primarily but not exclusively caused by developed countries so these are the problem uh, that are caused by developed countries uh, because of the rapid industrial growth especially in asia and then deforestation in developing countries so the defore deforestation that happened uh, in developing countries like in indonesia for example it's not 100 percent uh, developing countries fault you know because sometimes deforestation uh, are also uh, the the fault or the wrongdoing of the developed countries why like for example if they have uh, mining firms for example or agricultural firms that operated in the developing countries and they do the forestation in developing countries then whose fault is that 
is it the developing country's fault or the developed country's fault? I think uh, both share uh, the blame here, okay? And then these are some strategies for mitigation. Of course, we can tax carbons and we can have uh, caps on greenhouse gases. And then we can subsidies to encourage technological progress, okay? And then some types of adaptation that we can uh, do is uh, plant or policy adaptation and then autonomous adaptation. Uh, so basically the plant adaptation is something that are enforced by the policy maker. Meanwhile, the autonomous adaptation is an adaptation that are um, that are done by the, the firms or the industry, okay? or the agents in this case and then the next one uh, this is some economic models of the environmental environment uh, issue so we have privately owned resource and then inefficiency result from imperfection in property rights property rights is important if you don't have property rights what, what's going to happen is something called tragedy of the common so like for example if there is a forest here and then nobody owns the forest right and then what's going to happen is people is going to take advantage of the forest because there is no consequences there is no property rights for the forest and then nobody will protect the forest they will just take advantage of the forest so that's why property right matters what i mean here is so should someone own the forest no the forest should be protected by the government so that people do not take advantage of the forest okay that's just an example because um, protection from the government then automatically that the forest is owned by the government right that's why uh, they protect it and then the perfect property rights are characterized by universality exclusivity or excludability and then and then transferability and enforceability okay and then here uh, in the figure 10.1 you can see uh, static efficiency in resource allocation so if you have this q star unit of resource and then the marginal benefit uh, and cost so the marginal cost is this mc and then the d here is the demand and p is the price or cost uh, if the allocation is in this point then uh, it's a efficient allocation basically this is just like the equilibrium of the uh, resource market okay um, let's see so here we have the allocation efficiency so if we equate the present value of marginal net benefits of last unit consumed in each uh, period uh, that is for allocation efficiency consumer must be indifferent between consuming last unit in this period or in another uh, period uh, okay so uh, let's take a look at uh, this uh, graph for example uh, this was uh, the efficient resource allocation and now uh, let's see yeah, let, let's say like for example you are uh, the owner of this resource and then you see that uh, you have in total 75 unit of resource like resource X for example uh, the marginal cost uh, is constant and then here is the demand curve so if you sell uh, those 75 resource or 75 X that you own uh, right now then you will obtain the price of P but if you are willing to save some of those and then you're going to sell only 50 uh, in the current time and then you will obtain the price of ps okay and then this blue box here uh, this is uh, what we call the this is what we call the uh, scarcity rent okay so this is a uh, benefit or a rent uh, that can be obtained by the seller because instead of sell uh, all of uh, the x good 75 x good they only sell the 
50 uh, x good and charge higher price here okay so um okay uh, and then the next one uh, this is the common property resource so uh, we have inefficiencies uh, may arise because resource is not privately owned oh, so we have uh, we still continue our property right issue so what's going to happen with the common property is there is inefficiencies because it's not privately owned and then the traditional models do not concern themselves with equity and income distribution nobody cares about that if it's common property and then the family farmers can benefit from extended tenancy or ownership and then uh, who should buy publicly uh, on the line okay and then uh, this is misallocation common property resource and misallocation let's take a look at this uh, graph here uh, this figure so in the x-axis we have number of laborers and then the y-axis we have value uh, per unit of labor we have average product labor here and we have marginal product per labor here and the wage is here and then uh, average product is here let's take a look at uh, this so this figure 10.3 describes the relationship between the value per unit of labor on given piece of land and the number of laborers cultivating it okay uh, suppose uh, for the moment that this piece of land is privately held conventional wisdom tell us that the landowner will hire additional labor to work uh, the land until the marginal product of the last work is equal to the market wage at point uh, l star here um, and then uh, the workload is shared equally among the employees each of whom produce the average uh, product so uh, here right the 80 star average product however assuming uh, decreasing return to labor each new labor hired reduce the average product of all workers so the marginal product of each additional worker is thus equal to his average product minus the decrease in the average product across all other workers if an additional employee is hired beyond L star, so let's, for example, LC here, um, his cost of the produce, uh, sorry, uh, his cost to the producer uh, W will be greater than his marginal product, and the difference will represent a net loss uh, to the uh, landowner. Uh, profit maximizer thus will hire uh, L star workers with a total output equal to average product AP star multiplied by the number of workers scarcity rents collected by the owner so this is like the profit or the scarcity uh, rent or the scarcity land eh sorry rent uh, it's going to be this blue box here so if the uh, if the owner hire more than uh, L star labor, then um, it will not uh, it will not be able to produce as much as if uh, they only hire the uh, L star uh, labor. Okay, because you know that there is marginal. I mean, there is diminishing uh, average product uh, per labor, marginal product per labor. Okay okay and then understanding the tragedy of the commons uh, users fail to take account of an externality that as each uses more of the common resource the average return is lowered uh, for the others so this is what's happened ah sorry this is what happened when we have common resource without property right the average return uh, is lower uh, as uh, there is more people that use uh, the resource and then the traditional societies have sometimes responded effectively with social enforcement mechanism and it can be reviewed in the box 10.2 uh, in your textbook and then this is the Eleanor Ostrom's common property design principles derived from the empirical studies so the first one is clearly defined boundaries uh, of the resource system 
so define boundaries and then proportional equivalence between benefits and costs for the user and then collective choice arrangement including those affected and then monitoring this is very important with those who audit accountable for the users so if you just have agreement between people how to take care of a resource without monitoring them or auditing them then uh, most likely there will be some kind of um, moral hazard uh, of the people and then the graduated sanction it also matters and the conflict resolution mechanism uh, this is like the law and the regulation that is also important and then the recognition of right to organize and then the next step enterprise when resource are parts of larger system okay and then uh, we still continued with the environmental issue the public goods uh, public goods and pets regional environmental degradation and the free rider problem so uh, this about this free rider problem uh, i will leave it uh, for your textbook because uh, this there are some uh, interesting interesting study case in there uh, but uh, shortly we can uh, say that internalization of externalities is not easy and then uh, there is some free rider problems so uh, and then the next one is limitation of the public goods framework uh, one of the most difficult issue regarding the public good framework is the pricing mechanism so like uh, for example if uh, in the area where you live there is a well you know and then well the well is the only source of water in the area where you live and then uh, it's a common source common resource so it, it it's not owned by anyone and then the uh, and then the well um, is considered public goods uh, for the government and then if the government for example asks you to like uh, put your money to take care of the well then what's going to happen is most people they might not spend as much as expected to take care of uh, the well so that's why the pricing mechanism uh, for public goods uh, is not very easy Okay, so like 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 tax, for example, if there is no consequence for you to underreport your tax, you will definitely underreport your tax. Uh, so uh, with the public goods, uh, one of the biggest problem is the pricing mechanism. Um, uh, this is the free rider problem uh, in Figure ten point four. Let's take a look at this. So um, okay. So for the public goods, when you want to price a public goods, then you will do a vertical summation. Vertical summation here, like for example, we have person A, person B, and person C. Person A is willing to pay PA for a Q star, and then person B is willing to pay PB for the Q star, and then person C uh, is willing to pay pm for the q star so what you're going to do is you're going to do a vertical summation here so this plus this and plus this so that's how you're going to charge for public goods you do a vertical summation meanwhile for the private goods what you're going to do is horizontal summation with the horizontal summation it's it's like you ask like for this uh, price how many uh, quantity do you wish to have so that's why uh, you use the horizontal summation that's the difference between pricing public goods and pricing uh, private goods okay and then the issue regarding still the issue regarding urban development and the environment so the first one is environment problems of urban slums you know what urban slums is right so the health threatening pollutants of course and the unsanitary environmental condition yep that's also true and then serious impact uh, on the poor like we mentioned before they can be victim they can be agent and then the next one the industrialization and urban air pollution uh, like 
for example if you go to Jakarta uh, the urban pollution sorry I mean the air pollution is pretty high and then uh, we can identify this using environmental Kuznet Kuznet curve I think I have mentioned this few weeks ago and the pollution tax and then also absorptive capacity of the environment and severity of industrial pollution and their impact on health okay uh, so this is a model of pollution externalities private versus social cost and the role of uh, taxation okay um, so let's see this figure 10.4 uh, we have quantity of good x in the uh, x axis and the price in the y uh, axis so this figure depicts the typical supply and demand curve and in this case however we have labeled the supply curve so s equals to mcp where uh, because it represents the marginal private cost so marginal private cost is the mcp associated with the produ producing good x and the free market equilibrium price are qm and pm so that's the uh, market equilibrium and then uh, if there are externalities associated with the con consumption or production of each good x then the mcp curve does not represent the true cost of the good to society so what's going to happen is uh, you need to calculate the cost of the product uh, as the marginal cost, marginal private cost, uh, plus their externalities. So it becomes the MCS or marginal social cost, you know, so the MCP plus the externalities. And with the MC, uh, what's going to happen is, uh, wait a minute. So like for example, if each unit of good X impose cost of $2 on a third party, then we can obtain the true marginal cost curve MCS by uh, legislating. Like for example, if the additional cost of the externalities is $2 per unit, uh, then um, by legislating $2 per unit sales tax on the output, we can obtain the true marginal social cost. This pollution tax shift the private cost upward by two dollars. In here, it's upward by two dollars at every point to MCS. At the new intersection between demand uh, and marginal social cost curve, uh, X star is oh sorry, X star is like uh, the new uh, equilibrium, and now we have P star as the new price equilibrium. Okay, so this is. Um, with the pollution so this is like the pollution tax pollution yep sorry pollution tax okay so that's how you model uh, externalities and then uh, <laughs> let's see uh, what happened in the figure 10 point uh, six year so uh, a more realistic marginal social, cur social curve is drawn in the figure 10.6 as concentration of pollutants increase as total total uh, output increase the gap between social and private cost curve increase while aggregate demand remains low this differential will be small however however as the demand curve shift here from D towards uh, D accent with rapid urbanization and rising incomes, the importance of internalities uh, rises at uh, increasing rate. Uh, why? Because now, uh, instead of just look at this, we will uh, definitely uh, take a look at this. We need to take a look at this, right? Uh, this would suggest that the cost associated with the curing urban ills caused by congestion will increase faster than the rate of increase of the population okay and then let's talk about congestion now the problem of congestion clean water and sanitation so uh, they will have high health and economic uh, associated and then uh, drag on development of course yeah with the congestion clean water and sanitation 
it will have negative impact toward development and then impact uh, on poor and the private wells have led to land subsidence and flood and then impact on export earnings okay um, and the next one is the local and global cost of rainforest deforestation it seems like that's a big problem so that's why we specifically talk about it so the rainforest loss contributes to global warming yep unquestionable and then it also contributes to loss of biodiversity loss of livelihood uh, and then much waste in the process of forest clearing and those rainforest preser preservation and restoration is a global public good a restorative mechanism for the environment and the sustainable management of rainforest is a priority provide funds that relief to help uh, enhance biodiversity uh, in addition support for forest preservation as climate change uh, mitigation okay and then the next one let's talk about policy option in developing and developed countries so what developing countries can do to make sure they do not harm the environment so the first one is proper resource pricing and the community involvement and the clearer property rights and resource ownership and then improve uh, economic alternative for the poor and then improve economic status of women investment that yield returns regardless the shape of climate change wow that's such a huge investment right <laughs> investment that still yield returns regarding the climate change like uh, they give example here is a better road network what i can think of this kind of investment is something like environmentally friendly building or maybe electricity solar panel or maybe um, yeah, it's probably a such thing that uh, harmless for the environment and then the industrial emission uh, abatement policies so um, if you are curious about this I think uh, in your textbook uh, there are some uh, interesting study case uh, and then uh, the next one is the proactive stance toward adapting to the climate change uh, we really need to adapt to the climate change and then the next one how developed countries can help developing countries they can definitely lower the developing countries cost for environmental preservation so lower the cost for preservation and then they can have uh, fair trade policies where they reduce barriers and they do subsidies and then they can do debt relief and debt for nature swaps and then uh, they can also do a development assistance okay so uh, the next one is what the developed countries can do for the global environment the first and the most important one is emission controls including greenhouse gases and then this r d on the green technology and pollution control and then transfer of technology and then restriction on unsustainable production okay okay uh, i think that's all for the material for this chapter these are some concepts uh, you can review uh, by yourself see you for the next session